plenty of time for what's going to be a fascinating discussion. My name is Lisa Schultz. I'm a professor here at the law school, and I'm the co-director of the Murphy Institute for Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy. This uh, institute is a joint venture between the School of Law and the Center for Catholic Studies. I am one half of the directing team. The other half is Billy Junker from the Department of Catholic Studies. And our, our real leader is Sean Harris, who's walking up the aisle right now, who is our program uh, manager. Um, the Murphy Institute is really pleased to be able to embed our first program in our Hot Topic series this year into the day-long program that the Religiously Affiliated Law Schools uh, um, Association or group is having here at the University of St. Thomas. So a special welcome to all the participants in that conference. We're really lucky that we could create this, this lunch as part of our program. Um, the Murphy Institute is dedicated to interdisciplinary conversation, interreligious conversation, and exploring issues that are of interest um, in public policy areas. Our Hot Topics program, our monthly almost series of um, debates or conversations on topics that are of a pressing nature. Um, we've in the past debated in this room same-sex marriage amendment, embryo rights, stem cells, genetically modified organisms, abortion, sexual equality, immigration politics, incentives for living organ donations. Our program for the next year has got fascinating events coming up that we're planning, drugs, incarceration, and criminal justice, just wages, surrogacy contracts, rights of the family, pregnancy discrimination, and today, the easy, simple, very narrowly focused topic of justice versus love. Um, I want to make sure that everybody can see the, um, the announcements that are listed here. If you're here for CLE credits, there's the code. You can get mentor credits for this, and you can learn a lot. I was privileged to be able to be part of the initial conversations between two of our speakers today, just thinking about what they would talk about, and I was Th that alone was worth the price of admission, so I think we're in for a real treat. I'm going to turn this over now to my colleague, Tom Berg, teaches uh, um, uh, constitutional law and other topics and is a, a, a scholar of religious liberty interests, li religious liberty issues. So, Tom, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. It's uh, wonderful to be moderating this program. It is wonderful to have so many uh, students and members of the community here and also so many uh, participants in the Religiously Affiliated Law Schools Conference who are here at St. Thomas today. Uh, old friends, uh, new friends, I hope, uh, and so we're very happy to have all of you. Uh, Nicholas Wolterstorff is uh, one of the leading Christian theologians in the world. Right now, he has a book called Justice in Love, and it starts off with this. Two concepts long prominent in the moral culture of the West are those of love and justice. One can imagine a society in which either or both of these was absent. In such a society, nobody would think in terms of love or nobody would think in terms of justice. In our society, most of us think in terms of both. And the rest of this book is, a, uh, is an analysis of the relationship between justice and love. Uh, it's, a, it's a formidable topic, but a foundational topic for people who think in the Christian tradition and also uh, people in other traditions as well. We're very fortunate to have two terrific speakers on it today who will be uh, discussing and debating the relationship of uh, love and, uh, uh, and justice to the concept of civil law, and they come from different points of view. I'll just make a very brief comment about each one of them and then explain the program. Uh, Bob Cochran uh, from Pepperdine University is, uh, I think it's fair to say, really one of the leaders in kind of the, the movement uh, analyzing the relationship of relig religious traditions and religious thought uh, to law. He's been a leader intellectually, organizationally, and in many other ways. He's both a director of a law and ethics center at Pepperdine and also the founder of a uh, legal clinic uh, for people in need. Uh, David uh, Van Drunen is a uh, professor at Westminster Theological Seminary. He is a leading scholar focused on, among many other things, the distinction between the, distinctive, the, the role of the church, the Christian church, and the role of civil government, and he'll be emphasizing that in his 
uh, talks, I think it's fair to say. David is a, uh, an excellent theologian and also uh, a lawyer with a law degree. And so he brings that combination of, uh, of, of qualifications. Here's the way this will work. Each will get 12 minutes to make their presentation. Bob will go first, then David. Each will have then five minutes to respond. Uh, and then uh, we will take audience questions. The way we'll take audience questions, you look in front of you, there should be purple cards uh, on the desk in front of you. On there, it will uh, give you room to write a question and who it should be directed to. And you uh, hold up your hand, and a student will come along and pick that up and bring it up to me, and I will try to uh, uh, go through those and so we can have a balance of questions to both of our speakers. Uh, so with that said, um, I think we're in for a real treat today. Let's start with Bob Cochran. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's just a real treat to be here to see so many old friends and uh, some former students and former co former colleagues and uh, and others. And and thanks to Rob Vischer uh, for hosting the conference, from Mark to Mark Osler for organ organizing it, and great to be part of this. Uh, Lisa, thanks for asking me, and Tom, thanks for uh, for moderating our discussion. When I told my wife, uh, Denise, that I was going to be debating love versus justice today, um, and I told her I was on the love side, she said, well, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then uh, when I told her I was, uh, um, um, I was debating a, a seminary professor who was on the justice side, she noticed the, uh, the irony and that we're probably both a bit contrarians within our respective field, that a law professor would be on the love side and a, a seminary professor on the, on the justice side. Um, and uh, it's an honor to be in partnership and, I guess, conversation with uh, David Van Droon. And uh, this summer, I was reading his Divine Covenants and Moral Order. I would really encourage everybody to take a look at, look at it. Uh, terrific study of natural law and its relationship to, uh, to scripture and, and covenant. So I was reading it in the airport, and I got so, in, so into the, the book that at one point I heard someone saying, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Cochran, with a sort of a Ben Stein Bueller, Bueller type <laughs> tone, in, tone in his voice. And I realized that I'd been there reading through them calling my flight, through them calling group one, group two, group three, and group four. And I was down to that point where they were calling the individual names. And there's a group of people over there hoping to get my seat. So I just, just barely made it. But it's, it's that kind of, a, kind of a book. Well, in a provocative essay, which is in John Witte and Frank Alexander's Introduction to Christianity and Law, philosopher Jeffrey Murphy asks the following question, what would law be like if we organized it around the value of Christian love or agape? And if we thought about and criticized law in terms of that uh, value? Well, I, f I feel like I've been reflecting on that question for the last couple of years because I'd not, uh, not thought in those terms. And, uh, and I think most of us think in terms of justice and law, um, but to think of um, love and, and its relationship, um, I think is something that those of us who are Christians um, are called on to do, or I'd like to encourage you that that's what we should do. Well, Jesus taught his followers to love broadly. They were to love neighbors, Samaritans, and enemies. Uh, he commanded that they love in a broad range of situations, including conflict, when they're slapped, taken to court, and ordered about, it would seem odd to me that love should be excluded when we're in a position to have the greatest impact on other people, when we're in power. I'll argue that it should, that is, love should extend to those situations when we have power, when we're in the voting booth, the legislative chamber, and the courtroom. 
That being said, I think our duty to love extends to all those we encounter. And when we're in a position of power, we're likely to have responsibility um, for and to a lot of people. Um, the challenge is to figure out what love means in each of those contexts. Um, Jesus placed love in the center of law. Love of God and love of neighbor are the first and second greatest commandments, he said. Indeed, he claimed that they are the framework on which all of the law hangs. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets, was his summary. As Calvin put it, the purpose of the Mosaic law um, was to preserve that very love which is enjoined by God's eternal law. But he recognized that the Mosaic law was not intended to govern all nations, but he said every nation is left free to make such laws as it foresees to be profitable itself, yet these must be in conformity to that perpetual rule of love. Well, my focus will be on the Christian tradition today, um, the, um, the word that Jesus used was translated in the New Testament as agape, and the word agape has come to, um, is what Jeffrey Murphy was talking about when he spoke of, of Christian love, um, and the content of agapic love has largely been um, given by Christians, but it's not an exclusively Christian term. It was the term for love that was uh, in the Septuagint, the, uh, the translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the Greek translation uh, that was done um, by 70, 70 rabbis, hence its, uh, hence its name. Um, and it's a, a Greek term. Um, so you've got Christian and Greek and Hebrew um, influences maybe in the term but most scholars conclude that it is a Greek term had, did not have much content when it was first used um, by Christians and then given uh, by, um, or when it was uh, um, used by the Jews in the uh, Septuagint and then in the, uh, in the New Testament um, by the, uh, the New Testament write, writers. Um, well, it's... Um, it's best to understand what agape is by comparing it to other words for love that are Greek terms. Um, we use the term love to cover a multitude of sins, well, to cover a multitude of, uh, of things. Uh, the, in, uh, in Greek, you have eros, which is um, romantic love, um, sexual attraction. It covers a number of things as well. Um, you have philia or brotherly love, um, friendship. Um, our city, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly comes, lo love comes from that. Um, in Greek, there's storge, which is uh, um, affection, the love that parents might feel for their children. Um, and then, well, what's agape love? Um, well, its content has largely been uh, given by Christianity. Timothy Jackson uh, says it has three elements. One, unconditional willing of the good for the other. Two, equal regard for the well-being of the other. And three, passionate service open to self-sacrifice for the sake of, of the other. Um, the... Uh, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, as the Mosaic uh, law um, said. Jesus said we're to love our enemies. Um, unlike friendship, agape doesn't require mutuality. And note the strong contrast with eros. Eros um, is love which sees something lovable in the other that's uh, not necessarily present for agape. Um, Lewis says, eros, affection, and friendship, the natural loves, what he calls the natural loves, are always directed to objects with th which the lover finds in some way intrinsically lovable. Unlike the other loves, agape enables one to love what is not naturally lovable. Lepers, criminals, enemies, morons, the sulky, the superior, and the sneering, 
end quote. Um, like friendship, though, agape love wants the good for the beloved, including the moral good. Um, if, you, if you don't get anything else out of uh, today's session, uh, take this to, to heart. See the movie Junebug from 2005. It's a terrific, uh, terrific movie that a lot of people m missed. In it, Ashley Johnston uh, is played by Amy Adams. She has a ne'er-do-well uh, um, husband. Uh, it's, it's great, set in, uh, set in the South. Um, and uh, at one point she says to her, uh, her husband, Johnny, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. <laughs> and that captures an important aspect of, of, of agape. Um, Augustine says, love reprimands, ill will echoes. So an aspect of agape is wanting, to, uh, wanting the best for this person, inclu including that this be a good person. Um, Jeffrey Murphy argues that law grounded in love will generate, quote, moral and spiritual improvement in virtue. This may point to a danger in grounding law and love. Um, Lewis expresses that danger well. Um, he says, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It may be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral and busybodies. So um, I think um, true love will keep that in mind, that there's, uh, there's great danger in, uh, in, in love. Well, what's the relationship of love to law, or what am, am, am I suggesting the relationship should be? One. Uh, might be motivation, the motivation for voters and legislators in adopting laws that treat citizens well and for representing clients um, might be uh, love. Um, two, um, a law can be a means of showing love. Um, love can be reflected in laws as dramatic as those prohibiting murder and those ensuring that criminal defendants have fair trials to laws as seemingly mundane as laws that prohibit drivers from double parking. Um, and three, um, as suggested earlier, a law um, might improve citizens' character. Uh, Jeffrey Murphy suggests that if agape is our aim, then we'll design laws that, um, and in laws and institutions with the view to moral and spiritual improvement. Um, Love um, reflected in law may maybe hopefully will teach citizens to care, um, not just to abide by the law giving them, but to care for their neighbor, to love their neighbor. So, um, the, in, within the Mosaic Law, laws that required farmers to uh, um, leave parts of their fields of, available for poor people to come, um, will hopefully teach. Um, citizens to love their neighbors and to uh, reflect that love in other ways beyond what the, uh, what the law requires. Um, any more time or am I done? One more minute, okay. Yeah, well, the relationship of agape to justice. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in one minute. Um, Jesus also said a good bit about justice, the prophecies that um, um, anticipated him or that Christian believes, believe anticipated him, um, speak of him as bringing justice to the, to the nations. Um, he himself exclaimed at one point, will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and get justice quickly. Well, I'll let my, uh, my friend Dave Van Drunen go now, and then when we come back, maybe we can work on some reconciliation of the two concepts. While Dave is coming up, let me remind you, please be writing down your questions 
you know, as the speakers are speaking so that I can go through them and we can get started on the questions as soon as they're done. Dave. Thank you. And uh, as Bob was saying, I want to also express gratitude for everyone involved in hosting this and for the invitation to be here. It's very nice to be here and uh, glad we can do this this afternoon. Um, Bob and I have been collaborators on things. This is the first time that we've actually been sort of opposed to one another in this official way. Um, Bob, uh, I, I, I will, uh, I prepared uh, a, I, I have a 12 minute lecture written uh, and I'm going to present that to try to keep things concise and say as many things as I can in the time I have. And so I'm not going to use this to respond to anything that Bob uh, has said. Now, Bob began by mentioning that Jeffrey Murphy asked the question, what would law be like if we organized it around the value of love, especially Christian love, and thought about and criticized law in terms of that value? I claim that we ought not to organize law around Christian love. Christian love is an improper category to apply to law. Now, to be clear about one thing from the outset, I am not suggesting that law should be loveless in every sense. What I argue is that we ought not to organize, think, or critique law in terms of Christian love, that is, insofar as love is distinctively Christian. To make this necessarily brief argument, I must identify the nature and purpose of both law and Christian love. I begin with law. When we consider law, we are also considering civil government, or the state, since the state is the institution that ordinarily administers and enforces law. Thus, it may be helpful to examine Romans 13, 1 through 7, the locus classicus for Christian theological reflection on the state. Among several important things in this text, it teaches that civil magistrates have authority as office holders instituted by God, and that magistrates are God's servants who bear the sword to carry out his wrath against evildoers. Now, one of this text's chief puzzles concerns how and when God instituted civil office and endowed it with such authority. Clearly, Paul is not saying that God was doing so through the very writing of Romans 13, for Paul treats legal authority as something already existing. I suggest that if there is any text in scripture that describes God instituting legal authority, Genesis 9, 5, and 6 must be it. Romans 13 says that civil magistrates have authority from God to do good for society through bearing the sword and carrying out God's wrath against evildoers. Genesis 9.5 says that God himself will seek a reckoning from those who shed the blood of their fellow human beings. And then Genesis 9.6 explains that God delegates this work to the human community. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. This sounds precisely like the authoritative task of the magistrate described in Romans 13. Genesis 9.6, it seems, provides the theological background and explanation for Paul's assertions. In the big picture, therefore, in Genesis 9.6, God delegated authority to the human community to execute justice against wrongdoers. And in Romans 13, Paul clarifies that this authority lies specifically with the state's magistrates. Now, this connection between Genesis 9 and Romans 13 makes sense in light of the fact that Genesis 9-6 falls in the midst of the covenant God makes with Noah after the great flood. Let me highlight three aspects of this Noahic covenant. First, it is truly universal. God establishes it with the entire human race, every living creature, and even the cosmic order. Second, its purpose is preservative. It never promises blessings of salvation, such as the forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, or the conquest of evil. It only promises blessings of preservation, aimed at sustaining human society and the natural order, and at constraining evil. To use reformed theological terminology, this covenant concerns common grace, not, not saving grace. Third, the Noahic covenant is put into place while the earth remains, that's Genesis 8.20. That is, until the final judgment and revelation of the new creation. It is evident, therefore, that the Noahic covenant is God's means for preserving this whole world until the end of history. And one aspect of this preservative work 
is commissioning human beings to administer the law by executing justice against wrongdoers, a task carried out especially by civil magistrates. With lots of help from lawyers, maybe I should just note that here. We hope help from lawyers. Is this administration of the law to be a work of love in any sense? Yes. It reflects the love of God shown in the Noahic covenant. That is, it reflects God's benevolence in sustaining the world, providing it with many good things, upholding a measure of peace and order in human society, and bringing relief to victims of injustice. And as God in the Noahic covenant shows forbearance in holding back final judgment against a sinful world, so presumably should the administration of law show considerable forbearance in not bringing down the full force of the law against every wrongdoer on every occasion. Thus, the administration of the law involves love in at least three senses, promoting the general welfare of human society, helping victims through the redress of injuries, and showing forbearance or mercy to many wrongdoers. I now wish to highlight two important implications of my conclusions about law in light of the Noahic Covenant. One is that the state's work of administering the law is grounded in God's work of preservation through a covenant of common grace, not his work of salvation. The other implication is that this administration of the law involves the enforcement of just deserts and retributive justice. This is evident from the fact that Genesis 9-6 is stated in terms of the lex talionis, the eye for an eye principle of proportionality. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Now these two implications, I believe, demonstrate why a distinctively Christian love is an improper category to apply to law. First, while the state's work of administering the law is grounded in God's work of preservation through a covenant of common grace, Christian love is grounded in God's work of salvation through the new covenant in Christ's blood. One way in which Christian love is distinctive is through being a response to and consequence of redemptive grace in Christ. As Paul puts it in Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Or as John says, 1 John 3, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. And again, later in John, 1 John 4, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Christian love, therefore, is based in and imitative of God's saving work in the new covenant. Law, in contrast, is based in and imitative of God's preservative work in the Noahic covenant. Second, a distinctively Christian love is an improper category to apply to law because while the administration of law involves just deserts and the enforcement of retributive justice, Christian love excludes these things. Most famously, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Christ's apostles echo this idea. Paul writes in Romans 12, repay no one evil for evil. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. First Peter 3 also says, repay no one evil for evil. Thus, while the Noahic covenant prescribes the lex talionis as normative for civil magistrates administering the law, the New Testament says this has no part in distinctively Christian love. I note tangentially that I believe these two characteristics of Christian love that contrast with the character of law are related. Christian love flows out of God's redemptive love for the Christian in Christ. And this love of God in Christ is a forgiving love that satisfied all claims of retributive justice against us. Thus, it seems to me 
This, it seems to me, is precisely why Christian love, reflecting God's redemptive love, refuses to press claims of just deserts, but instead freely forgives. Now, in contrasting two characteristics of law with two characteristics of Christian love, I believe I have established my main claim. Law ought not to be organized around, thought about, or critiqued in terms of Christian love. To do so is to confuse the nature and purpose of the Noahic covenant and the nature and purpose of the new covenant in Christ's blood. It is to confuse God's work of providence and his work of salvation. It entails asking law to be something it is not meant to be, to do things it is not designed to do, and to forsake things that it ought not to forsake. I realize that even those who may recognize the force of the previous argument may be disinclined to believe it's really true because of the intellectual and practical difficulties it seems to entail. Murphy's account is attractive in holding that, while Christian love suggests that law should be reformed in certain ways, love and law can and ought to fit together harmoniously. My account, on the other hand, may seem to create an uncomfortable tension or even hostility between Christian love and law. What are the consequences if God has authorized civil magistrates to administer the law, in part by enforcing retributive justice, while God also requires Christians to practice a love that forsakes retribution? Are we left with some sort of Anabaptist or pacifist solution in which the state may indeed be appointed by God to accomplish certain purposes, but Christians should have no part of it? I reject that conclusion strongly for a variety of overlapping reasons. Let me just present one reason. In the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount forbids the lex talionis most clearly and forcefully, but the sermon is not a political constitution or legal code. The sermon presents an ethic for the coming kingdom of heaven as it is somehow to be manifest already here and now. The state and the legal system it administers does not manifest this coming kingdom. The New Testament never describes it in this way. On the contrary, it describes the state in terms of the Noahic covenant, which concerns God's providential government of the world in its present form until the end of history as we know it. The coming kingdom of heaven breaks into this Noahic world in the midst of history, but does not for now replace it or take away any of its legitimacy. Christians live under two divine covenants, the Noahic covenant and the new covenant, and they must fulfill responsibilities under both, even though I freely admit these respective responsibilities are sometimes in tension with one another. I cannot discuss here how to dis uh, negotiate that tension, but I conclude by noting that just because Christian love is not to find institutional expression in the law does not mean it can find institutional expression nowhere at all. Later in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus illustrates how a retribution spurning Christian love is to be embodied in the church. I have in mind his instructions explicitly given to the church for resolving conflicts when, quote, your brother sins against you, Matthew 18. Here the wrongdoer is not to receive his just deserts or to be punished in any way, but is to be urged to repentance and to be forgiven, reconciled, and restored. Paul guides the church in Corinth in the same way in 1 Corinthians 5. The church is the institutional embodiment of a distinctively Christian love. So perhaps we've stumbled into the answer to, to Murphy's original question. What would law be like if we organized it around the value of Christian love and thought about and critiqued law in terms of that value? Well, law would then be like biblical church discipline. And biblical church discipline, while mandatory for the church, is no business of the state. Thanks. Well, I do think I'm going to take um, my first 30, 30 seconds to uh, um, mention that Dave and I edited a book which came out about nine months ago called, um, um, called Law and the Bible. Um, we had nine theologians and nine law professors. We divided the Bible up into nine sections, and each of us did a section, um, tried to mine a section. A pair of us uh, tried to mine a section for what it might say about the, uh, the civil law. So I did Jesus and the law. David did uh, Gen Genesis. And I think um, 
whatever disagree and, and by the way you'll see some of the disagreement reflected today in those in those sections um, I will say that whatever disagreement Dave and I may have today um, we would probably agree that whoever you think wins the debate today you should go out and buy his book <laughs> law in the Bible um, well Dave um, as I understand it has argued that Jesus' demanding kingdom ethics, including agape love, apply institutionally only within the church. In this view, the lex talionis remains the standard of justice for the state, though Christians rightfully manifest forgiving and reconciling love within the church and with their neighbors, they should support the church's imposition of proportionate retributive justice. Um, I guess I, f I find that um, to be, or I guess I would challenge it uh, whether that um, reflects the, uh, the New Testament teaching, but I also think practically speaking it's a, um, it's a difficult division of responsibility to apply and leaves the Christian somewhat schizophrenic. Um, a first point I would make is that love of neighbor is commended as a response to those outside our own community in Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. Um, so that love is not just to be manifested within the church, it's quite clearly to be manifested beyond to Samaritans, uh, or whatever the analog is in your culture, um, and, to, uh, and to enemies. Um, Jack Sammons, who I'm sure would love to be here with us, uh, retiring this year, terrific professor at uh, Mercer, who's done a lot of work in the law and re religion area, has an essay on the Good Samaritan. And one of the things he says is that the love that Jesus calls for in the story of the Good Samaritan there was applied by the Good Samaritan individually, personally, to the, uh, the person that he met, but that a legislator might reflect love toward um, um, injured, injured uh, people by um, passing legislation which would uh, um, establish um, um, a police system or otherwise that would um, avoid the harm um, from, the, from the beginning. Um, well, my, uh, my suggestion, I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly what um, David envisions the, uh, the Christian legislator, legislator, the Christian voter doing. So you have one mentality, one heart that's created by Christian disciplines that's applied within the church, and within the church we apply agape love, but when we get in the voter's booth or the um, judge's chambers, um, we have some, some other heart or some other uh, set of values. Um, I don't mean to uh, suggest that applying agape in both situations is going to be simple. Um, trying to figure out what your responsibilities might be in the government setting, uh, trying to apply agape love, I think is a, is, a, uh, is a real challenge. But I think it's the different setting that might lead to different responses, um, include different responsibilities, um, that's not going to be an, an, an easy question to navigate, but it seems to me that the Christian life's not an easy one, and that, um, but that that's what the Christian is called upon to do. Um, well, just a few ways, as I mentioned earlier, it seems to me the scripture calls for both justice and for a love. Jesus himself called for both. How might they be reconciled? Just a few bullet points, and then I'll, uh, I'll uh, turn things back over to David. Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, says justice is the primary form of love in social organization. Uh, Tim Jackson says punishment is often love taking justice seriously. Paul Ramsey says, love will always do at least what justice requires and at times more. And then finally, Nick, uh, Nick Walterstorff in his book, which Tom mentioned, which is a, a, a terrific book, um, says agape, um, what he calls love is care, 
incorporates doing what justice requires. Well, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to your questions and comments. Maybe it would be best for me to, in, this, in this brief response to reiterate something that I tried to say in my presentation earlier, and that is that I do think that the law is to express love in a number of ways. And I think, in fact, that doing justice is a way of showing love. That as justice seeks to address wrongs that are done uh, to other people, uh, there is love shown to the victim uh, who has been wronged and who presumably ought to be in some way have his, have his or her wrong redressed. Uh, it shows love to the broader human society by preserving this ongoing preservation of uh, order and peace. Uh, and I think there also can be an element of love to the person who is punished, who is taught something about, um, about good and right uh, and uh, fruitful living uh, in this world. Now, I think, the, I, I think in a lot of respects, Bob and I would agree, in, in a great number of respects, that we think that law and think that justice is meant to be promoting the human good, is meant to be promoting the welfare of the people who are affected by the law. And I think, as far as I can tell, and, and maybe the questions will uh, help to, 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 to clarify this, is that our difference is in what we understand agape love, or the way I would prefer to, have, to say it, as, as a distinctively Christian love. And as I see it, a distinctively Christian love is a Christian love that is, that is rooted, that flows out of the redemptive love of God in Christ. And that involves at its heart a forgiveness that does not demand the fulfilling of all the terms of justice against the person uh, who committed the wrong. Now, uh, I'd be happy to try to defend that uh, a little bit more. I would cited a, a, a few texts uh, of scripture in my uh, presentation. Now, I believe that that bestowing of forgiveness, that pronouncing the idea that all the claims of justice are satisfied and a person is forgiven is something that civil law is not able to do. It is not given that tax by God in Christ to be pronouncing that forgiveness. Um, the church is. In the New Testament, the church is given the, the, the task of proclaiming that forgiveness and showing forth that forgiveness in the way it conducts itself in the handling of conflicts and wrongs within the church. Uh, I think to clarify something uh, that maybe that I said in, that, uh, in Bob's response is I certainly don't think that uh, Christian love should only be shown within the walls of the church, only between uh, Christian and Christian. I do believe that we who are Christians are called to be, we, we, we ought to desire opportunities uh, to be showing that love to other people in a wide variety of areas of activity in this life. And how that's going to take form, I think, is it's an open question and is going to vary so much on circumstances. Uh, but I would want to defend the idea that when the Christian is taking up political or legal responsibilities, and Bob gives up examples of the voting booth or the courtroom or the legislature, that the Christian does not have the responsibility then to try to administer and promote the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, but to be sure that justice is done and that love that's consistent with that justice is expressed uh, in that law. Um, doesn't mean that the Christian can't seek the expression of agape, forgiving love uh, in, uh, towards uh, the people involved uh, through other channels in, uh, in other circumstances. So I think my time is up.
Thank you. Thank you both. We have a number of great questions. They sort into, uh, into some different categories. So uh, a, a number of questions have to do with the concept of equity. Uh, and so let me pose the question. To, I think there's a question to each of you that is a challenge to each of you. Um, uh, if, uh, Bob, if we base law under agape love, wouldn't the outcomes sentences, fines, fees be different for each individual, thereby eliminating objective penalties. Would that be fair? And turning this question more towards, towards David, isn't there a place for equity and restorative justice in the legal system? And doesn't that call into question the distinction between rules of justice versus love? Yeah, brief response since we've got a lot of- Are you turned on there? I think it's not. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. Um, um, brief response, since we've got a, got a lot of questions. Um, I think, generally speaking, equal um, justice should be the norm, that the same um, infractions should um, generate the same penalties. So I'm not suggesting a completely individualized uh, decision in criminal punishment for um, each case and each person. Um, and in, in part, I think equal, equal justice is a loving, loving thing to, to afford to others. Yet I think the, um, the formulation that grew out of the Christian tradition, justice tempered with mercy, captures what um, um, judges should, uh, should seek today. There are factors about the individual person that I think might uh, justify um, mercy in, in individual cases, whether it's exercised by juries or judges or um, the, the, the executive. But, uh, but in, in general, I guess I would uh, agree with the thrust of the question. Equal, equal justice should be the norm. I think that's um, a loving rule. I appreciate the, the, the question about equity and restorative justice. And I, I agree that uh, equity and restorative justice should be part of the law and part of our conception of justice. What I would say is that these, this is a part of justice. And you don't need to bring in agape love to, to explain these things. And in fact, they're not concepts that arise out of a distinctively Christian love. Uh, Greek philosophers were talking about equity before, long before Christians were talking about uh, the love of God in Christ. Now, it seems to me that equity is about uh, trying to get the law right, uh, that there are times when what we might understand as the, the, uh, the, the wooden interpretation of a, of a piece of legislation doesn't seem to give us justice in a particular circumstance. Uh, that's where the concept of equity applies. So it's not bringing in something other than justice. It's trying to make sure we get justice in a particular situation in which that might be in danger. Restorative justice, I think that is a, uh, a, an important concept. I think it, it's helpful that we've been having discussions about restorative justice now. Uh, I think that justice ought to be not just retributive. I, I, I mentioned that. Uh, I think restorative justice should also have an important role. But again, it's restorative justice. Uh, that what, what the legal system can hope to do, it's a challenge, but what it can hope to do is to try to bring some measure of redress to wrongs and to, bring, to restore some sort of measure of peace and harmony between those who have come into conflict. Uh, but I still do not think that the legal system is able to bring a restoration that is able to pronounce and bestow the forgiveness uh, of, of sins. That may be able to happen on an individual level uh, between those who have come into legal conflict, but it's not something uh, that uh, a legal system is able to uh, bestow. Um, let me do a brief comment on restorative justice. It's, uh, of course, a form of alternative dispute resolution. Um, back in the mid-70s, mid I remember when the uh, the ABA and Justice Berger discovered alternative dispute resolution was trying, were trying to figure out what it, what it is and what it might look like. I remember going to an ABA conference where they brought a Mennonite 
out of the hills to explain, <laughs> to explain to people how they resolve disputes. It seems to me that uh, that was a picture of um, the Christian community bringing agape love or their means of exercising agape love, presenting it to the legal system, and uh, it's had a terrific impact. Uh, here's a wonderful question, I think, uh, that both of you, uh, are directed to both of you. Does the answer to the question whether Christian love should be the organizing principle of law also answer whether we should have Christian law schools? My, my, answer, my answer would certainly suggest uh, that, that we should, that there's something special that uh, the Christian faith, uh, that religious uh, people from religious communities can, can offer to law, and, uh, and I would say yes and amen. All right, David, you're on the spot I, I, here. <laughs> I probably don't have as much at stake in this personally as some people here. Um, and whether I get out of here in one piece may depend on how I, I, I answer. Uh, I, I, I went to Northwestern. I didn't go to a, a, a religiously affiliated uh, law school, which, which, which may be why I'm, I'm so deluded on this uh, subject. Uh, I, I would, I mean, I, I, I think it's great that there are religiously affiliated law schools, uh, I, I think. Certainly, I think it's, it's valid and I think can be a great service when groups of Christians will uh, found law schools. And my only, my, uh, the, I guess the only thing I would say is that um, there is plenty of theological reflection on justice to do. It's not as if you need love in order to think theologically about the law. Uh, and it would seem to me that perhaps uh, a, uh, a Christian law school uh, that's seeking uh, a, a helpful, sound theological perspective on the law. One of the things that one service they could do is to help clarify the difference between the distinctively Christian love that is proclaimed uh, and embodied in the church with the, uh, the, the work that the state and the legal system is entrusted with doing. And I think even if we don't conclude that Christian love is to be the organizing principle of the law, uh, there is an immense amount of helpfulness that Christian theological reflection can bring to thinking about the doing of justice and what law is all about. Okay, uh, challenging questions for each of you. For Bob, love, uh, I'm sorry, genuine love can never be compelled precisely because it's a free gift. How can the state force a person to love another? Well, and I don't, I don't think the state can force another to love um, some, some, someone. Um, um, I think the state can force someone to act in a loving manner um, and, and hopefully um, the, uh, the, the, the practices of acting with love might reinforce um, the uh, the, the attitudes of, uh, of people towards, uh, towards one another. Um, of course, his, history is mixed. As some, uh, it seems to me, some attempts uh, of law to change people's hearts um, have um, had, an, had an impact. Um, in some particular instances, <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been a mixed answer. But I think the, uh, the obvious um, example is uh, the, the civil rights movement. Uh, I was right in, the, right in the middle of it, I mean, within my own um, um, family and pe people that I know, it seems to me that uh, legal changes uh, reinforced um, what I think is, uh, is real Christian uh, teaching um, and I think helped to move the country uh, move individuals in a uh, in a loving manner. Can I respond to that yep. before? Yep. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that uh, maybe the civil rights movement is a good illustration of why justice rather than Christian love should be the organizing principle of the law. I, I was just in Montgomery, Alabama uh, a week ago today at a conference on rights that was inspired by the, um, it was, I mean, the, the location of Montgomery, Alabama was not a coincidence. Uh, thinking about rights from Magna Carta to this, um, the Civil Rights Movement. And we were talking about rights, 
And it seems to me that, that that's about justice, that the civil rights movement was about rights. Uh, it was about uh, not doing injustices to other human beings based upon, their, based upon the color of their skin. Um, it didn't, it, it wasn't, it, uh, uh, certainly a lot of, there were a lot of Christians who were motivated, who were inspired uh, 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 by their Christian faith. Uh, certainly there was a lot of Christian love shown informally, but I think it's very important to insist that you don't need to be a Christian. Uh, you don't need to have experienced the redemptive love of Christ in order to be required by the law uh, to treat other people justly and not to violate their rights. So I, I, I guess I, I would wa I'd, I'd want to challenge that appeal to the civil rights movement as um, as a defense of law as opposed to justice as organizing principle of legal system. Doesn't love inform the, the content of the law though in that situation? I mean, a, a story like the Good Samaritan yeah. tells us to, to, to think much more broadly about who is our neighbor and, uh, and, and that will transform our ideas of justice as I think was the case in the civil rights movement. So if Will we get the kind of broad understanding of justice if we divorce love from it? That's, that's kind of channeling some of the questions yeah. Would, raised. Does that mean yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that's I, to you. I, yeah, I mean, I would say that, um, again, I want to come back to say that I, I don't say that law should be without love or justice should be without love. I, I, I do think that uh, justice ought to be an expression of love in certain, in certain senses. And so... Clearly, Christian faith and the love which flows from that can be a source of motivation and inspiration. And I say we certainly should hope that Christians who are, uh, who are serious about their faith and devoted to uh, service of Christ will be concerned about, in their civil affairs, uh, doing justice. We'd like to think better than those who don't have that uh, motivation and, and inspiration. Um, but I would still say that I don't think, I, I would say that the kind of love that the civil rights movement, uh, or that, let's see, the, 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 the kind of love that should be reflected in the civil rights laws would be a natural law love. A love that doesn't, that isn't necessarily grounded in the redemptive, saving, forgiving love uh, of Christ. I think we need to evacuate here for a class coming in, which will probably be talking about justice and maybe even be talking, if implicitly, about love. So thanks, our uh, the, the book that Bob Cochran referred to that they did together is available with some other books out on a table in the hallway. So